Good morning, good afternoon to everybody, and welcome to my first ever tag. Hey! Hey! Got to start somewhere, wouldn't you? Okay. The cave, there'll be a quite lot of similarities between that last talk and this one, given that the themes come up again and again, I'm afraid. That's the way these things are. The Cambridgeshire Dykes. Now, for those who don't know, in the southeast area of Cambridgeshire, four large linear earthworks between Newmarket and Royston to the southeast of Cambridge. Now, they, Newmarket and Royston weren't there at the time, so we ignore those. The names of these things are many and varied, but we come down to four. Devil's Dyke, Flea Dyke, Brent Ditch and Branditch are the accepted terms we're going to use today for these. One the time, Devil's Dyke, the biggest, easternmost, up to, what, 14 metres across, um, 7 metres at the bottom, 5 metres deep, and lovely flat bottom to it, I'll send uh, Flea Dyke, a little bit smaller, coming down again, uh, about 3 metres across the bottom, 9 on the top. Flea Dyke is one of, of the four only Flume Dyke gets itself rejigged and recycled uh, more than once. Brent Ditch, getting smaller again, five and a bit metres across, flat bottomed again, and the Brand Ditch, the smallest, five metres across and two <coughs> metres deep. So, they do sit on the downward slope of the, what you might call the arse end of the Chilterns, up in Cambridgeshire. And the accepted view really is that they they, they link the, again, the, the primeval filthy forest, the wet fen and the high ground, <laughs> and they mark those two points. Except only really the first one, the Devil's Dyke, actually does hit the fen. The other three just hit sort of slightly wet bits. They don't really hit the fen. And if you stand on the Brand Ditch, this being South Cambridgeshire, you look towards the lowlands in the north, or towards the uplands in the south, it's much the same, really, I'm afraid. With a grossly exaggerated uh, vertical scale, they do that from uh, southeast to northwest. But in reality, they're doing that. <laughs> it's very flat around it. <laughs> and the consensus view, which, well, not in this room, but out there in the world, and taken from the Wikipedia entry, when it, the Devil's Dyke, was created, it completely blocked a narrow land corridor between the southern edge of a region of waterlogged marsh known as the Fens in the northwest and the dense woodlands in the south, so making circumvention difficult and forming an effective defensive barrier for the lands to the east. Consensus view in the Wikipedia. So there are barriers to travel on that Ashwell Street, Icknilled Way route, and they are defending the, the Holy East against something in the West. Now, that something used to be the 5th, 6th century Hertfordshire Britons on their horses, galloping up to take over the Anglo-Saxon East Anglia. Then it kind of changed to being the 7th, 8th century Mercians. Um, but because of where they are, you've got to have a bit of both, really, to come in there. Or you might just say, well, let's have it as Wessex or the Vikings. Or, you know, who's it going to be that is in, invading East Anglia, and at which point? Defensive. They don't really sit where they should sit to be defensive. If you look at the Devil's Dyke, it's on the back end of this big hill. It should be a few yards that way. Flame Dyke tends to sit in valleys or in, in, in over the by, by, by high, high land. Flame Dyke, topographical model, that's roughly where it sits, up through there. Whereas for defensive defensiveness, defensive, you put it there, or you might put it there. But you wouldn't put it there. Um, there is, it stays to the high ground in the low ground, and the low ground in the high ground, making passage easier, I think, through there. Therefore, they were not, or moved, a slight hangover, I need some water. Or some beer, ideally. They were not simply constructed with defence in mind. They are there because they have to be. Neither, and back to Civil Fox again, you can't take Civil Fox, said you. Neither do they follow the shortest distance between the upland and the fen. As Civil said, and he wasn't wrong about everything. Reach at the Devil's Dyke's Fenwood end is on a promontory, an adjacent alignment or shortened the required line by about two miles. Now, he was right. You move it this way a bit, it's about three miles you save there. If you save three miles in length on a thing that big, you can build it three yards taller. Um, Flea and Dyke's the same. You knock Flea and Dyke back a bit, say a few miles there as well. So, they were not 
constructed with convenience or efficiency in mind. They're there because they have to be. Wide flat bases never sit well with me on defensive ditches. In Cambridgeshire, you have a flat ditch when you reach the water table and you stop or you get wet. This is chalk a thousand meters deep. You can dig a V-shaped ditch, you don't. You flat, nice flat bases. Okay, that said, <coughs> part two. About a year and a half ago, I did an evaluation just off west of the Grand Ditch. Quite a big evaluation for um, a solar farm. Uh, and coming off of, this is the Grand Ditch here, coming off of where the Saxon version, diflex, deflex, deflex is the word, isn't it? Underneath that, you get a whole stream of other ditches coming through. That's the geophys, and that's geophys with excavated trenches. In there are three early Iron Age ditches, spanning 18 metres wide, later Roman trapway on top of them. Uh, dated by ceramics, by astrigraphy, and by carbon 14 to about the 5th century BC. So, if you look at the older um, antiquarian excavations of Randwich, they all found it as well. They didn't know what it was, and they sort of called it there and things like palisades and whatever. But they're still there from left, 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 yeah, left, 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 28 version. Once you've found one triple ditch Iron Age thing down there, you go look for some more. Now, eight kilometers down the road is the Mile Ditches. Mile Ditches, quite well known, known to be Iron Age, early and middle Iron Age down there. 2.7 kilometers long, three ditches again, and 21 meters wide, same sort of size. And note, the splaying out at the upland, sorry, oh, the splaying out at the upland southern end there, it's quite nice. Uh, Dead Man's Hill, which is another five kilometers through the west, um, as yet unexcavated. But let's face it, they're going to be Iron Age. They are three of them in the line. They're beautiful. I want to go and dig them, but I can't yet. Um, three ditches, 21 meters wide, same size again, all the same size roughly. Once you've got those three, you think, well, let's find some more. You know, why not? Look at the blanks. Big blank up there. Nothing in that. No one knows anything about the bit there at all. So, have a look. Have a look at that. <laughs> Doesn't take long on Google these days. The Google's a great thing. Three more ditches sitting up there. Now christened by me the Addington ditches. I've also got water ditches up there. The Addington ditches, three of those, 23 metres wide. 4.6 kilometres long. This gap, not quite so good, but it is there. There's a, all the, all the ingredients are there. There's a spring head, there's three, three, Roman Iron Age barrows up there, there's parish boundaries, there's crop marks, it's all there. Another one sitting in that gap there. And then there are three more tiny ones floating around down the south. There are some more, they go as far as Luton, but I can't do it on this size sheet, they're only going to be tiny. So I'm just going to focus on this one area here. So, yeah, this one over here, a twelfth the size of Wales. It's a reasonably sized chunk of land, but I can't get bigger. Once you look at those, you think, well, in this big chunk of area, where are the Roman roads? Well, they're there, they're there, and they're there, and they're all parallel to their adjacent dikes or ditches, and they fill in yet more gaps. So now you've got, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, one goes to Colchester and to the North Sea and to Europe, <coughs> two of them go to London via the, and to the Thames and to Europe, obviously. You've got the 12 reasonably equally spaced dikes, ditches, roads, you want to call them, varying things. Then you look at those two ditches, well, is three a magic number? Yes, it is in the INA, so it's nine, obviously, but it's also a dual carriageway, isn't it, really? It's a road. It's not, it's not, it isn't speed bump in the road, it's a road doing this. That's what it is. All those ditches and dikes and roads are heading up for the watershed on top there. Now, they go to the watershed, and you come down to all the valleys going to the east and the south, the rivers and the valleys, which go to the Stour, Blackwater, and to Europe, 
and they go from the Stoughton Lee to the Thames. Then you look at all the pictures we've had so far, and a few more of the Saxon dikes. And what's the common thing amongst them, apart from the fact they're banks and ditches, is they've all got footpaths running along them, on the tops, on the, in the ditches, or to one side. They're all footpaths. They're all there. And that one, that lovely engraving, made three. Shut the that piece said, on top of the rampart is a cursor sort of way, 18 feet in breadth, sufficiently wide for the passage of cavalry or chariots. And like that, it's a big old thing on top of the bank of that is. So, you've got 12 routeways heading up from the south, up the valleys, over the watershed, and they're going down towards the River Cam, down there. If you take them by their most direct and obvious routes, <coughs> down to the cam, they all meet at bridging points, fording points, ferry points, etc. on the cam there. Then you put that lot on the geology, it makes more sense. Yeah. There's two big bands of chalk that run through here, with between them, the Melbourne Rock, Melbourne Rock, Melbourne is in Australia, Melbourne is in Cambridge. Um, this Melbourne Rock, is the water bearing strata for the area. And then below that, flat gulp down there and glacial hill up on the tops. You put on that the topography and what we know of the archaeology of this area. I'm in a bit more now, there's lots of things being done down there now. And what you get is one of the lovely sort of landscape zones. You've got low flat Finland pasture, a strip of prehistoric settlement just beneath the water line, the, the spring line. Arable farming on the flat bit behind that. Then you go up the hill a bit to upland pasture, and on the till, that's your forest up there, your woods, woodlands. And these things are the basis of what I'm gonna call territorial boundaries. Splitting up, everyone gets a slice of the cake in, that, in those landscape zones. You put on the known and assumed whereabouts of the actual three ditched road boundary type things and they all sit in the arable. They're, they're crossing the arable zones for taking presumably sheep to be honest from the upland zone down to your settlement you're taking people up and down everything goes up and down on the edges of your territories through those trackways not through the arable crops. So they're directing people. They're also directing if your way routes Ashwell Street routes, not it's guidance, it's not blocking, it's guidance. <coughs> Taking the road to the north through the settlement zone and to the south through that pasture, not through that central arable zone. And each conveniently has a road, an iron age hill fort in it. Not all of them, I haven't quite got there yet, I've got two more to find, but they will be there. <laughs> each one's got a little hill fort up there, which is lovely. And they take up now <coughs> modern day parishes, villages, you've got about seven to ten parishes, villages per block and they are about a hundred square kilometres each in size. So, to sum up, I'll read. Civil ditch alignments are boundaries separating early Iron Age territories, these based on earlier Bronze Age settlement patterns and possibly before that, another story, and they are used as access tracks for livestock, presumably sheep, through the territory's arable land and as through ways for longer distance travel coming up the rivers and river valleys from the east coast and the Thames estuary. These boundaries and routes dug as relatively slight ditches in the 5th century BC are clearly still relevant in the 5th to 7th centuries AD when they are recut on exactly the same lines. And back to that one again because I like it. It does show this old gentleman walking on the right down towards Europe. And this chap walking back up on the on the right again that way. We travelled on the right in those days. We were Europeans. <laughs> Thank you. That's a nice quick talk.